Hi there, my name is Levi, and I'm going to be talking to you today about how you can make your organization calm, effective, and empowering. And when I mean organization, I mean, you know, any business team, nonprofit, you know, a team of people. You know what I'm talking about. And I titled it Don't Be Like the Rest of Them because uh, I want you to uh, really think differently whenever it comes to your organization. The things I'm going to be bringing up today are... Uh, you know, they're unique. They're things that a lot of people have never heard before. And it's a, it's definitely a new way of thinking. And, um, you know, some advice before I begin. What really, really helped me when I first heard this advice was to take this approach. Rather than looking at your existing organization and how it works and trying to just take little tidbits of what I'm saying and apply it here. Little tidbit, apply it here. Because you, you you think your organization is running really well with just a couple little issues. So you want to just fix those couple little things, then you're good. Instead, I, I, I really recommend, because um, this is what did it for me, and what really got me to understand this and, and see the true effects, is to take a, take a big step back from your organization. Look at it as a whole whole and try to uh, you know not be afraid to make drastic changes because um, it's these drastic changes that have little effects here and there that just makes your entire culture just so much healthier and also makes these ideas here really truly work so let's uh, again yeah what are we talking about well it's it's for this is for people who are already on an organization and they want to, you know, change it. They want to improve it. Uh, or it's for people who are starting a new organization. They want to try to, you know, find a good way to just kick it off well. Um, but mostly for people who have an existing organization right now, especially because they can compare and contrast between, you know, your organization now and, and what I'm saying. Um, and for people who, you know, want to grow an organization uh, because you're starting to feel like uh, as you're growing, you need a little more structure, a little more, um, you know, some kind of organization to help, you know, manage the the new people and everything like that. Um, but in the end, all we want, everybody, all we want is an environment that is calm. Uh, we know what that means. It means not juggling a hundred tasks at once. It means not feeling FOMO and feeling anxious. It means just just you know being very mellow and having an environment that allows for that, being productive. Uh, we, we all know what that means. Um, and then, you know, welcoming and empowering, same kind of thing, uh, making our members really feel like they're part of something. And then all this just equals happiness. At the end of the day, we all just, we just want happiness. I mean, that's that's what we're here for. So uh, to kind of give you an idea of why why me, why did I create this talk and, and where did all these ideas come from? Well, it's because I'm honestly a productivity nerd. So... Uh, I am somebody who is, I'm a maker, so uh, I create things from scratch. I, I write software, I write code, so I build um, you know, web apps and mobile apps from scratch. I'm a woodworker, I build things, I, I build uh, things from scratch, you know, from the idea to, the, to it being done, all from me. Um, I love making new things. I'm an engineer, I love designing and inve- inventing new things. Um, so with that being said, I have a million ideas <laughs> as, as an entrepreneur and as a maker. Uh, and I, I always have cared about productivity a lot to seeing every single day, like how can I get better and better and better? Um, so through that, I've tried to just always improve my organization flow, the way that I work with other people, the way I work with myself. Um, so I just, I just really, I just pay attention to all these details of how an organization runs. I um, and always trying to improve it. Um, I, I believe that power and control of people sucks in any organization. I don't care what it is. And, uh, the way that I run my organization is honestly kind of a little, uh, protest against that, you know, trying to make it where you can't have power and control over other people. I just don't believe it. I don't believe it's healthy. And, um, when I was in college, I had this amazing internship program that's like nationally known. And rather than usual internships, where the the company gives interns like a a, a ceiling, or that they they or it's a red tape where they can't go beyond that. They actually 
have their employee have their interns um, do just what full time employees do within a month you're actually working on the real product that real customers are touching all in the first month they are the ones that they gave me trust they they gave me tasks that they would give full timers and say hey we 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 trust you you can do this um and it felt really good it was just this amazing feeling that was addicting and it hit me right here in the heart and uh ever since then it clicked to me of like ooh i should really think differently about my organization like uh don't be like everybody else who runs the organization you know top down and things like that like there there's a there's something here like i i really needed to just start thinking out of the box and last thing I want to remind you, of course, is if something doesn't scare you, it's probably not worth doing. A very smart person told me that a while back. And um, I, I want to just say that, uh, again, think differently. Be, uh, and really, it, it, if I always have just found, uh, truly honesty, when you think about the, the topics in this talk, they're going to be different. They're going to be unique. They're going to have no control, have no power, have lots of trust. And that's hard to do sometimes. It's going to scare you. It's going to make you feel really uncomfortable. Like, I don't know if that's going to work. I don't know if I'm okay with that. I'm not used to that. And that's okay. But um, t- trust me. Whenever I have I have found something to sound scary, it's it's usually the right decision. Uh, it's usually like, okay, this is a sign. I should be doing that. Seriously, follow it. Like, like, try it. It For me, it works. Follow what scares you. Lastly, who am I? I write code, as I said, and um, I've worked on many different organizations from you know, corporations to nonprofits and, and startup companies. Um, and uh, currently, I'm a freelancer working on my own where I'm, a, I'm building apps from idea to launch. So I, am, I, I have my own organization organizing myself and managing myself. Um, also, I am, uh, I'm a project and team manager for a university where I manage a group of um, in, uh, students where I teach them how to write code and then I, I manage them to write code and um, uh, make the make apps for other students. So yeah, long, long story short, um, I've, I've worked for uh, diverse different kinds of structures, different kinds of running businesses and, and running organizations. Um, and I everything in this talk here um, I do for myself as a solo person, and I also do as a team of students and managing them. Um, I always put this slide on my uh, talks. I just want to tell you that these are my opinions and my experiences. They may be different for you, and that's okay. Um, don't worry about that. Uh, so I just want to tell you that you know your experiences may vary, of course. Um, this is just this is my advice, which comes from my experiences in my life, which is unique to me. Um, so the evolution of the way that I work, um, you know, I, I started out as a very corporate uh, feel and actually like had an internship with a corporation. Before that, you know, I, I, I ran everything corporate where it's very top down, where you work for your boss, you work for your boss, you work for you boss, you know, all very, very top down. Um, and, and, you know, tons of long meetings all day long because there's just so many big groups of people having to work with other big groups of people um and uh so lots and lots of you know lots of control lots of uh that kind of thing and then kind of moved into this uh scrum agile uh, workflow with startup companies whenever i left the whole corporate thing you don't have to worry about what scrum agile is you don't but it just think of it as it's uh there's still plenty of structure around it um, but it's, you know, not as many big, big meetings. It's more smaller teams kind of thing. Um, that's because you're probably a smaller business. Um, and then, uh, I have now transitioned into what's, what I call the base camp way. Um, and last, and, and really a big, big piece of this, it's all kind of goes along with my last slide. You know, your experiences are different, everything like that. But I want to just push that everyone, myself included, always be changing your process never ever stop improving your organization if you treat your your team as your number one product make it your number one priority then everything else kind of falls into place 
Because if your team is calm, if your team is productive, there everything's going to just fall into place. Everything else that you work really hard for. So if you truly make your team your number one product and always be tweaking it all the time to making it more, uh, more calm actually, you know, the, everything else just just kind of falls into place. Never ever stop improving it. Basecamp is a company, so I run by the Basecamp way, and it really just means. I run my business and my teams the same exact way that this company called Basecamp runs their team. They were founded in 1999. They are a uh, they were a design consulting service, and they've transitioned now into a product. So they, it the company is called Basecamp, and they they sell this product called Basecamp. Go to Basecamp.com. You can check it out. Um, well, something that's very unique about this this company though that. I'm not I'm not someone who, you know, cares about millionaires and, and goes off for, for money, but um just the fact that uh, that this statistic exists for this team is is quite unique. It really says something. It has one of the highest employee per profit ratios in the entire nation or in the entire world. And that says something. I believe that, that really proves that this team, which is about fifty employees, um that really proves that they are uh, they are productive. They're very, very, very productive. So um, if we're brought up about productivity, this is one of the most productive teams out there, I would say. And this is a, kind of an overview of, the, of this team. Um, and remember, we're thinking differently here. We're thinking scary. So Basecamp does not have meetings. Yep. Crazy. Now, if they do have a meeting, if they do have to have one, it's two to three people max. They're a 50 employee company. Two to three people max. That's it. I have actually seen the personal calendars of the CEO and a few employees at Basecamp. They've shared them. And their work calendars are like blank. There might be one single thing in there per week. The rest of their time is working, actual working on their skill. You know, if you're a designer, you're actually doing design work the entire time. Nothing else, no meetings. Uh, they work 40 hours per week maximum. Um, they don't work evenings. They don't work uh, nights. They don't use group chat. They don't use like, you know, Slack and hip chat kind of thing. They don't do video chats. Um, there's no, you know, no instant messaging, nothing like that. Um, they uh, are a fully remote, fully asynchronous team. Um, so they have people all around the whole world working together on same on the same projects. But you might have somebody working in the complete opposite side of the world from you, working different times. That's why asynchronous work is important, uh, where you might be working on the same exact project as somebody, but they're halfway across the world. And you got to make that work somehow. You know, How do you do that without working on it together at the exact same time? Um, so that's, they're able to do that and they don't have deadlines, you know, again, trying to keep the place calm, um, for their workers. So some of you might be thinking like, well, if there's no meetings and there's no deadlines and they're no fully asynchronous, well, pff, and, and there's no group chat, you know, how on earth do they get anything done? We're going to talk about that, how this you know company gets stuff done. So they work in six-week cycles. Every six weeks, it's a new set of work. And in that six-week time frame, they only work on one to two big tasks. And a, a big task means uh, it's, a ta it's one single task that will last the entire six weeks. So it's a lot of work. It takes six weeks to complete. And they work on four to eight small tasks. That's it. They never, ever work on three big tasks, nine small tasks. It's a finite number, and they say no to every other idea that they have. So uh, they assign one team per big task. So that means one or two um, teams, and then one team for all the small tasks. And they actually have only two to three employees per team. So if you do the math... Well, it's a 50 employee company and they're, you're only telling me that they have maybe like, you know, 10 people actually uh, working um, because of if there's only, you know, 
three three small teams and three people per each. Well, we're talking nine people. Where's the other? There are 40 people on the company. You know, they have other rules. Like, they have research. They have people maintaining the servers. They have customer support. They do have unique roles to the organization that they're doing other things. So this is more about the, you know, the kind of people who are working on the product for the team that we're talking about today. Um, not necessarily all the other tasks going on. Um, so yes, one team, uh, you know, so again, just you know, one team per big task and one team just for all the small tasks. One team consists of two or three people and that's it. Basecamp is a tech company. So that means they have w they uh, like to assign one designer and one to two programmers per team. So if you look on the right, this is kind of the way that a lot of organizations work. And the the image, I just want to say, like you see three red and three blue. Try to think of more like 10 red, 10 blue. The image is a little, you know, not, not the best. But um, think of like the red being designers and the blue being programmers. And, you know, a lot of times you have the, the you have like the design team and the programming team. They're in separate, you know, parts of the office. They, they are, in, they definitely work on their own where a designer gets a task, you know, and they're like, they, they just feel like they have to collaborate together and they are working together all the time, you know, collaborating on their, their, their tasks. And the programmer, same thing. They, they get a task and they're just working on it together, you know, they're, they're, and then they just happen to have cross, um, cross like working together like a cross communication between the design team and the programming team um, going back and forth well that's where team and product man pro uh, product management or yeah project management excuse me um, is important because if you have you know 10 designers yeah it's you probably need a, a manager to manage all 10 of those people and then you know same for the programmers if you have you know 10 of them you need to uh, have a manager for them but then you also need to have managers for the projects because there might be six people involved um, between the designers and the programmers working back and forth well Basecamp works a different way they work like the bottom where instead of these you know these small teams they are putting you know rather than having the designers working with other designers they're just put taking one single designer and just ma and putting them with the programmers and saying here's your task go off with it you got it. We trust you. We we think you're a great designer. You got this. You don't need us. The other designers say. And then same thing with the other teams. They just they you know, they take those disciplines. They split it up. They assign it to a little team, and they say, "Go with it. We got like we trust you. You're awesome." So if you notice the difference between the top and the bottom, there's a lot. Of, there's no arrows in between anymore, and there's a lot less arrows. Uh, if you can think of it, if you know, on the top there's eight red boxes there's a lot of um, there's a lot less arrows pointing to each other and so that means that Basecamp does not have managers no form of them they don't have project managers they don't have team managers and it's because they don't have to because if you don't have if you have lots of people involved big groups of people involved that's when you need management but if you keep the team small or you know you have like one single task and one task only um, assigned to uh, you know these three people, they manage themselves. It's a, it's a small number of people. Two or three people is nothing. So they don't need um, management for themselves. Those three people work independently. They don't work with other people at all. They work on everything themselves inside of themselves. So they don't need to have communication going to other teams. They work independently of each other. So therefore you don't you just simply don't need it. Long story short. So the members are trusted and empowered where, you know, that one designer's on that team for that one task and we say, hey, you got this. We believe in you. You're going to do amazing work. Those te those mini teams are focused on one single task. They don't have to juggle a hundred of them like we're used to. You have one task for six weeks. No more, no less. That's it. That's calm. Because um, really, now you, just have, you just have to know that you have one task only and we're not going to sneak another one on you. And that's awesome. Um, so meetings, meetings suck for a lot of reasons and there's, you know, we kind of want to avoid them at all costs if possible. And it's because of the time commitment for one, it's a one hour meeting is not one hour. It's not, I'm sorry. 
it's actually uh, X number, where X is the number of people involved. If you have eight people attending a meeting for an hour, that's an eight-hour meeting, actually. That's a lot of time for those people that could be doing something else. Um, I really don't like how meetings demand your thoughts now. I'm not a big fan of that. Think of a meeting um, that you're in, and you have one person who is talking. They're only talking for, you know, 10 seconds because someone's going to interrupt them <laughs> after that 10 seconds, of course. Um, and, you know, they talk for 10 seconds, and then they just wait. They pause. Because they're waiting for someone to respond. And so someone responds immediately with a thought. Creativity takes way, way, way more thought than a fraction of a second to respond. Way more thought. Why are we not giving ourselves time to have creative thought and thinking about something? Why do we have to make decisions now? Why do we have to talk about ideas now? Um, I just don't understand the point of that. I would rather have time to think on things. So, um, and also, we're only human. A lot of arguments can come out of meetings, too, because you might hear an idea, and your initial, initial reaction is, oh, that is stupid. That is the worst idea I've ever heard of in my life. But if you give yourself some time to really step back and have some compassion, you know, some time to cool down, you might be able to realize, okay, I get where they're coming from now. Really, it, it works for me, at least. We're only human. Uh, and you need to talk right now. You're in the zone. You have your headphones on. You're, you're, you're in the zone. You're, you're being really productive on your task right now. And all of a sudden, someone interrupts you, says, hey, it's 11 a.m. Let's go to that meeting. Why would we take that, that time away from somebody? That zone, why would you break up that zone for them? You know, it, what if I work, what if I take a break um, after lunch to check up on, you know, my email and I want to check in on things then? Let people, let people stay in the zone. Basecamp does not just assign a task to two or three people for six weeks and say, okay, see you in six weeks. We trust you. Come back. You know, don't talk to us. They use this, um, and actually, they use an app, and they uh, they call it check-ins, where it's a automated bot that asks them every single day at like 9 a.m. Uh, or actually, excuse me, by like 5 p.m. What'd you work on today? And then also asks every single Monday morning, what do you plan on working on this week? And it's very important that is a bot. It's a it's a machine that asks these questions to you, to everyone there. And that's because. If a human was going to go up to you and, and ask, hey, what'd you work on today? Or what are you going to work on this week? It's nagging. That's how it's interpreted. Because a human is you know part of your team, and uh, we don't want to be like nagging and feel like that. But a robot, we know it's coming. Every single 9 a.m. it's going to come. The exact same time for everybody. It's expected. And you know that robot is, is a neutral party. They're not part of organization. So it's not feeling the nag. So kind of a quick recap here. Yeah, there's there's no management. No, because there's just simply no need. We work in six week intervals with a set amount of tasks, no more, no less. That's what we're focused on for that six weeks. Use a computer program to prevent micromanagement and nagging, you know, working like, you know, looking over your shoulder kind of thing. But um also may I want you to mention that the check ins are you know, if you have 50 employees being asked the same question every single day, what you work on, it's not meant for everyone to read everyone's posts every day. Maybe you are uh, helping somebody with a task that they want help on. Maybe they're a, you know, a new designer and they don't have a lot of experience yet on the team. And you want to just kind of check up on how things are doing. So maybe you just want to read up on Scott. You know, he's a, he's a new uh, they're a new designer. You just want to check up on how they're doing. So you just want to read their posts for the first week to kind of see what they're doing. That's what it's meant to do. Check-ins are meant to just kind of just see how some people are doing, but you don't have to read them all. Okay, so now we talked about like how they get work done, but let's talk about how they come up with the ideas of what to work on. Okay, so kind of transitioning here. Clear the mind, new topic. Now, I know this is like a white text on like kind of a white background I apologize for that but um i want to talk about i'm sure that all of you have have definitely seen like a google doc or a trello board or some post-it notes a whiteboard full of ideas 
things that you you know you wake up with an idea uh, for work and you just you you have to let it out. You have to you just love this idea so much it's going to revolutionize the world. It's it's amazing. It's so exciting. And you have to write it down somewhere. So you put it on a Trello board. You put it on the whiteboard, something like that. You have to put that idea down. That's called a backlog. They are uh, is a log of tasks, a list of tasks that you are going to work on sometime in the future. Well, Basecamp does not actually have a backlog. In fact, uh, I, I've I've actually done a workshop uh, with Basecamp, where I've like met the CEO and I have asked a bunch of questions, and um, the CEO challenged me to delete my backlog, and I told the CEO how scary uh, that that seems to me because all my ideas are there. It sounds so scary. I deleted my backlog four years ago, and I haven't looked back since. I don't miss it. I've never regretted it, and I've never created one since. And it's because you can't predict the future. I'm so, so sorry, but you can't do it. The world's changing too fast. People are changing too fast. You just can't predict the future. So therefore, if you can't predict the future, the backlog is now worthless. There's no point to it. And it then becomes a distraction. And the, the image behind here is actually an image I found online of a Trello board where each card, white card, is an idea. It's backlog. And honestly, when I see something like this, it gives me anxiety. How would you like to go to work and someone shows you this? You're going to immediately feel, oh, we got a lot of stuff to do. We got a lot of stuff going on. That's not calm. This is overwhelming to the extreme. And honestly, I'm guilty of it. My boards are this long or even longer. I've had some that were, and I'm sure we're all guilty of it, that are like 300 lines long, uh, cards long. So, yeah, delete it and don't look back. I promise you, you're not going to regret it. So then where do ideas come from then? Well, they uh, the way Basecamp works is they actually have all of their employees rotate and do customer support. Like once a month, every employee... Uh, like every employee once a month or twice a month, they would do customer support for an entire day. And this allows them to hear directly from their customers and understand their pain points. So that means that everybody in the company is on the same page with all these patterns that their that their customers are currently having and their pains and their struggles right then at that moment. So um, what happens is everybody on the team at any point has the opportunity to pitch an idea and a pitch is a written document that consists of text and maybe some sketches, like some napkin sketches that they take a picture of. Um, but it's the it's the practice of writing a document that is really really beneficial because um, you know usually whenever you have an idea, you call somebody up, you text them, and you give them three sentences, and you say, this is my, "Here's my idea. What do you think?" I'm so sorry. That three sentences is the worst version of your idea that that, that exists. Because you just came up with it. It doesn't have deep, full thought yet. It's not fully formed. So you just decided to share the worst version of your of your idea. Um, the right side here is actually a... It's only about a third of, of the real thing. But it is a little tidbit of actually a real pitch that somebody... One of the employees at base camp uh, pitched to the team. Um... But yeah, it's a fully formed definition of the problem, which of the idea, all in one single page that anyone can read. And what's so cool about I, pitches is that you have the full floor. You're forced to have the full floor where no one can interrupt you. So at the end of the day, it's a very, very good way to make sure that your ideas are heard fully and you, have, and you are giving the idea fully, not a half thought, but a real, full, deep thought. And written documentation, it works. I now use written, written, written documentation for like pretty much everything I do. That's why like Basecamp doesn't do video chats. They don't do instant messaging because they believe that written documentation is just worth so much more. And it's because documentation is hard. It takes work to make a full document. In fact, this picture, like this video right here I'm making, this is my full thought. If I was trying to, in fact, I actually have an envelope sitting right next to me, which is the my my ideas that I turned into this talk. That envelope, if I was just to hand an envelope to somebody or have a meeting and talk through that envelope, 
it would be horrible. <laughs> They're not fully thought through. Um, so this video is actually my pitch, my full thought idea. Um, so when when you write something down, when you document something, it uh, it's hard to do and it takes time. And if you find yourself to kind of like get the document halfway done, but you never ever finish it, you know, weeks go by and it's not done. Honestly, that's a red flag to me. That's usually means that if you don't want to finish the document, you know it's a bad idea. You know it's an idea that's simply not worth pitching. Well, awesome. Red flag. It, it filters out the bad ideas naturally. Awesome. Um, and then, like, while I'm, while I'm writing a document, I find that I'm writing it in a way that, you know, I'm communicating with the reader. It's a conversation back and forth. And while I'm writing it down, I find that I might realize, oh, wow, that just gave me an idea. And I ended up I ended up solving the problem in my head right then and there. And then, oh, I don't need to pitch the idea anymore. I solved the problem. It's done. The documentation is the practice of documenting. is able to weed out bad problems and solving the problem all on your own. It does work. It really does. But then also three, creativity sets in where the pitch can become way, way better because you start editing those drafts. You start ri- you start thinking of ide- questions that your your reader might have, and you try to answer that in there. So you have full thoughts that have full creativity. Creativity takes time to develop. Let it happen. Documentation works. Tr- try it. It really does work. So um, now, what happens is, people make pitches anytime. It can happen any time that they want. They can pitch ideas to the full team for anyone to read. So that means that everyone's voices are heard. Everyone has the opportunity at any time to pitch any idea that they have. And then we have to make a decision, right? So every single six weeks, the CEO, the CTO, and the strategy person, three people, all get together and have a call. And those three people are the only people that make the decision on what the big and small tasks are for the next six weeks. So maybe on your organization, you have elected uh, or voted in people to make the decision. Um, but those three people are trusted. They're the ones that we don't, like no one else makes the decision because you had your chance. You pitched. You had your voice heard. And those people are trusted people in an organization. And so, you know, more than likely, they're going to make the same decision that everyone else would be making because we all trust them. So we don't need everybody's opinion and vote. Because those three people are trusted. We voted them in or whatever. And so they're going to make the best decision for all, for us. They know the vision. They're leading the ship. And then also, um, after the, we after these three people have decided what big and small tasks to work on, they then also assign those, uh, assign those big and small tasks with teams. So they've built relationships with members, with people on the team. And they have an idea of like, ooh, ooh. I know that Joe is going to have an amazing idea or, or some amazing experience to bring to the table for this task. I want to I want to have them give it a shot. Or ooh, Dana is a uh, is an awesome person who's talented at this, but I want to expand their horizons. I I, they, I know that they would love this challenge. Let's give this one to them. But also, they might reach out to these employees or members, and they might say, "Hey, you know, here's here's a, a big task and a small task. What one would you prefer?" And between these three, they're the ones that make the decision and, and help to figure out what people are on what team for the next six weeks. So yes, um, everyone has their ideas heard. Not worried about that. They all get their voices heard because they can all pitch. And yes, we all trust those people. Um, they make the visions here the ship. Yes, yes, yes. Um, so really, uh, oh, lastly, those people, the CEO, the CTO, and the strategy, um, they are not managers. Again, there's no managers involved. So what's really, really awesome is that the CEO, for example, of Basecamp is actually a designer. They get to design still. They actually spend most of their time designing. The CTO spends most of their time um, you know, talking to members of the, the tech team to really plan out the vision for the tech. They are actually spending most of their day on their skill that they love and appreciate. Make sure you do that as well. People that are skilled in this stuff, really skilled, let them do that skill. So there's no backlog. It's worthless and distraction. Employees um, get to 
They they are able to know the customer pains, so they all be able to pitch ideas. Maybe your organization doesn't have that opportunity. Maybe you do have some people that are the relationship builders. They're the people that go out to the community, out to the, the customers, out to the people, and they come back with this information, and you just trust they're going to give you the good pitches, perhaps. Um, maybe uh, those people that go out to those you know relationships, they come back and they they tell others about those um, experiences so that way they can spread that knowledge who knows how you want to run it but make sure that you know everyone is able to pitch so that way they all have their voices heard and then the three decision makers they make the decision and that's that um so let's now move into some of like the kind of other things that they that base camp does that's kind of how they work um so let's kind of get into the other stuff about them so you know we have a <laughs> People, there's a reason that your backlog has 200 things in it. It's because there's so many ideas out there. You probably wake up with new ideas all the time. You might have an email from a customer tomorrow at 7 a.m. with an idea, and you want to make that idea happen for them. There's just new ideas happening all the time. But I'm so sorry. You got to learn to say no, and you got to get really, really good at it. It takes practice. It's hard. Say no, di- say no by default. So... Because we are only working on one or two big tasks every six weeks and four to eight small, that is it. You are going to say no to everything else. Let's say we're three weeks into our cycle of six weeks and someone comes up with an amazing idea that we have to do or something that we feel is an emergency. Sorry, you got to say no. You got to say we're going to work on that in maybe three weeks from now, maybe maybe six months from now, maybe never. It's just the way it is. That's the way I work as well. When I think of any idea, I usually write it on a piece of paper and I um, kind of just like, you know, sketch things out to have the idea and I throw that piece of paper away. And then I find that ideas that are worth doing, I end up sketching them more often and I write new ideas down and I'm ske- I'm talking about them in my head a lot more. Those are the ideas that are important. Not the ideas you wake up with today and you feel, ooh, as soon as possible, I have to make that happen. Or a customer contacts you with an idea that they want you to do, and you say, ooh, I'm going to make that happen for you, I promise. That is ASAP. That's making things happen as soon as possible. You need to learn to say no to ASAP. It's a very, very scary word. Say no to things by default. Every pitch you hear, say no to it. In fact, if you email Basecamp right now with an idea, they're going to reply back to you as saying, thanks, but no. Seriously, they're going to tell you no. They're never going to tell you yes. They wait until they see patterns in their customers and they realize, hey, over the past six weeks, we've heard this a lot. Let's work on that. Yes, ASAP's scary. ASAP is not calm. Okay? just That's just the way it is. So um, I talked about, like, you know, that they don't use instant messaging. Now, Basecamp does, they do, they do uh, have the ability to do instant messaging, because I do want to tell you that when I say no instant messaging, I don't mean that they literally don't do instant messaging. It means that they don't do it like everyone else does it. Because it's not that you use a, t- that a tool that's bad. It's how you use it that's bad. And instant messaging is not calm. It's There's tons of FOMO um, involved. There's the fear of having your voice is not heard because conversations are happening so rapidly with so many people that you just you are glued to this this tool that you can't ever leave because of FOMO. Group chat is really like being in an all-day meeting with random participants and no agenda. That that kind of explains it all. And honestly, this slide kind of sucks. I apologize for that. It really is my excuse to give you this URL at the bottom of the screen. So really just take everything I've said with a grain of salt so far and read that that URL, that blog post. It's actually from it's from Basecamp. They actually wrote that blog post. I promise you it's worth your time. It's very short, and it will explain why instant messaging, the tool, can be really, really bad. Also, why it can be good. It's a great place to be to have fun. It's a great place to hash out um, like emergencies whenever they need to be done really quickly. Um, it's just how you use it that's bad. So being calm means there's no as soon as possible. Yeah, we say no to everything, so that means that there is no ASAP. That's it. So, as I mentioned before, I uh, I went to 
the Basecamp headquarters. And I actually met with the CEO in a workshop um, where we had the opportunity where we had the opportunity to ask any question we had, and the CEO would, um, you know, show you his personal calendar. They would talk about you know their their team, kind of things like that. Um, and uh, so I was talking to the CEO and kind of asking questions, and he told me the only way to be productive and be more productive is to remove things from your to-do list. That is the only way. It's not to use the latest and greatest app. Like, oh, I, I heard about this new app that's so fast for email, or I heard about this to-do list that's just game changer. We have to use it. That's not going to help you. And it's also not... Um, so, yeah, that's the, like the latest and greatest tool is not going to help you. It's also not you know getting an assistant that's going to help you. It's not... Um, trying to work more evenings it's going to help you it's simply saying no to as many things as possible and saying no way more than saying yes the ceo of the company ceos are usually busy with a million things working 60 out like 90 hour weeks he works 40 hours and his calendar is empty he says no way more than saying yes everyone in the team has a finite number of tasks to work on you're assigned one task and one task only for six weeks and we are not going to give you another one in six weeks. That is calm. <laughs> you know what the expectations are. Um, there's no nagging micromanagement over you to going to give you stress and anxiety from, from higher ups especially. Um, and so what's so cool is because you've said no so much, you get to do what you love. I looked at my calendar for the following week, just like before I did this, prepared this talk, and I am very proud to say my personal work calendar, I looked at it, I have two things in it. Thursday, I have a doctor appointment. Sunday, I have some friends coming over to the house to the backyard. And like next week, I have two meetings because I'm doing a one-on-one -on -one, um, with my couple of my students. And that's it. Those are the only meetings I actually do. The entire, the entire month, every single week, I have one meeting with every student and that is it. So that means that we now, we get to spend the maximum amount of time writing code and doing what we really, really love and what we're really, really good at. Maximize the amount of time that you're doing things and you will be calm. This makes you happy. Also, we're empowered to do things. You're trusted. We trust you. You're in a small team as the only designer there and you're going to be amazing. We know it. Do it. We, we believe in you. And because there's no one looking over your shoulder, nagging and micromanagementing you, you know that you have done the work on your own and you can be really, really proud of that work. We're happy for you. And everyone's voices heard are through pitches. Makes you feel good. And productive, being efficient. Well, we've said no to everything, so we can spend so much more of our time doing what we really, really love. And we've said no to management and meetings, which is a lot of you know time-consuming things. Um, we've said no to a lot of things on our to-do list to erase those things and allow it to allow us to work on our skill and our skill only. And decisions are made really fast to not give us roadblocks, really holding us back on things. Because those small teams, that one designer on that small team, they're making the decisions of design for that small team. And so the decisions are made very fast because it's made by one person. And those big decisions are made by those three trusted people for the next six weeks. We don't wait for decisions to be made. They're made for us. Because we trust them. And we're able to spend six weeks on one single task, and one task only, um, these small people, these small groups are. And so we're not half-assing many tasks. We're uh, working on one single task and doing it as best as we possibly can. So that is it. Um, uh, Basecamp, I've learned everything that... Uh, learned everything here from reading their four books. And I actually reread these books all the time to remind myself things and keep up with it. Um, and I've also, yeah, been to a workshop that they offer uh, every now and then. But really the books, the books are where it's at. Um, they're actually very, very short reads because they are so good at writing that they're 100 pages long, double space. Very, very, very quick reads. Um, their blog, Signal versus Noise, it's very, very good. But the books pretty much cover everything the blog covers. So really just read the books, you're good to go. But eh, I, the books aren't important. The books are to you know learn the material, but you have to practice. You have to try this stuff. And you have to give it your all. 
And you have to be always willing to change things to get better and better and better to really follow what be comfortable being uncomfortable. But a buddy of mine, Andy Stoll, said that, and I love it. Um, so really, trust me, you have to try this stuff. You have to practice it. It is the only way to do bet to uh, to really give it a shot, to really get better at it. Um, so thank you so much for the time. Appreciate it.